lot of independent contractors in Montana. You could be one of them, most likely. A lot of us have extra jobs, and, and those are independent contracting jobs. Truckers, small businesses, gig workers, a lot of that laborers, part-time, anybody who fills out a 1099. There's a reason we like our independence here. Um, when we falter, it's nobody's fault but our own personal accountability. That's one of the Montana values, I think, that we hold dear. So we are independent fiercely. There is a new Department of Labor policy that's going to try and upset that apple cart. Boiling it down, the policy will try to redefine what an independent contractor is and try to force you to be an employee of a company that you do business with. We get into that issue today on Voices of Montana. It's time for the fastest hour in radio from Montana for Montana. Voices of Montana with Tom Schultz. Call in today at 866-627-5483 or text a comment or question to 781-627-5483. And now, here's your Braveheart host, Mr. Tom Schultz. Don't know where some of that stuff comes from, Cody. I'm not even going to ask. I am a freedom. 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 Yeah, yeah. well, that could be the call about every day around here, that's for sure. <laughs> thank you, Cody, appreciate that. And thank you guys for being here, too, making us part of your Montana mornings, sometimes just the afternoons. Uh, and even in uh, a couple of stations there, hello to Bozeman and Livingston, it's uh, in the evening. But appreciate that uh, and uh, contacting us here. It's Tom at VoicesOfMontana.com. Got those phone numbers, too. Uh, text us a message if you have something today. This will be interesting as we uh, look at this new Department of Labor policy. And instead of me trying to kind of muddle through it, I can't. I, I, I get this. I really do. I kind of summarized it a little bit that this policy is trying to redefine what an independent contractor is and, and then really essentially force you to be an employee of a company that you may actually be doing business with. Um, and uh, let's get right into it here. And, and welcome first, um, Deborah. It's Debbie Kaplan, Deborah Abrams Kaplan. Uh, and you can find her at Kaplan Inc., K A P L A N Inc. Dot com for more information. She's part of the uh, Fight for Freelancers group, and this is a group that is pushing back, uh, is challenging this new Department of Labor law. And with that, Debbie, good morning. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. We really appreciate you taking the time to talk about this important issue today. So I appreciate thank you. Yeah, thank you for you know standing up for uh, for these gig workers and, and contract workers as well. And your attorney is with us, and that's the Pacific Legal Foundation attorney, Wilson Freeman, the Pacific Legal Foundation. We've had them on the program before, public interest law firm that, um, well, they're the brave hearts uh, in all of this, really, uh, defending freedom. Good morning, Wilson. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm, uh, I'm well. Thanks for having me on. All right. I, I appreciate that. Who, uh, who, uh, should we get the, the legal person to, to uh, explain this for us, Debbie? Or do, I think so. Yeah, okay. Wilson, um, give us sort of the who, what, when, where, and then we'll get into the why of this. Uh, but what is this new policy? Well, sure thing. So the Department of Labor, of course, is a big federal agency, uh, and they have authority over who's considered to be an employee under federal labor law. That's federal wage law, really. We're talking about minimum wage. We're talking about overtime. There's a lot of obligations that employers have vis-a-vis their employees. I mean, under federal law, you minimum wage and overtime are the two biggest, two most important. Now, there's a bunch of other federal laws. You know, you mentioned 1099s. That has to do with tax law. Uh, you know, obviously, there's who's an employee for purposes of union law. Those are different questions. Here, what we're talking about is uh, federal wage law, minimum wage and overtime. But that's really important. Um, You know, that has a lot of obligations to your employees uh, under those laws. So the Department of Labor and its authority to regulate this sort of federal minimum wage law and overtime law, they've put out a new policy which makes it a lot harder or uh, more difficult to know who is an independent contractor uh, under, you know, uh, uh, under the principles that, that generally apply under that law. So what's going to happen, what that means for freelancers like my clients is they're going to have a harder time being, being classified as independent. So it's, it's a real, uh, you know, it's going it's to really be a kind of sea change in who can be classified as independent and who can be an employee under the law. It's going to mean a lot of new obligations for people who work with independent contractors. And I think a lot of them are now going to be chilled or frightened into not working with independent contractors at all 
because they're going to be afraid of bringing the wrath of the Department of Labor in on them. And we, we'll get into the why on this, too, and why they think it's a good idea. And maybe there is a need to clarify some of these terms. Uh, but let's go back. Debbie, Debbie Kaplan again, journalist, yeah. content marketing writer. Um, how will this impact? Tell, what do you do and how will this impact you? Well, as Wilson said, there's a, there's a big concern. There's always been a concern over how, how you work with your clients. And some people, some people do want that employee protection. Many of us, I would say the majority of independent contractors, from what we've seen in research, 75% of independent contractors want to remain independent. So the whole idea of trying to protect workers and provide some of these these protections is not actually what the majority of freelancers want. And we want to continue to be able to make our living the way we want to make our living and have that flexibility, be able to set our own rates, and really be able to call our own shots and have multiple clients and run our own businesses. How long have you been part of this so-called gig economy? Is it fair to call it the gig economy? I don't I don't think well, that describes it accurately, but... Um, yeah, I yeah. think the gig economy term came up more when Uber and some of those platform-based uh, companies started making bigger inroads. I've been a freelancer for more than 20 years. Um, it's a very common road for writers as well as of a lot of, a lot of other kinds of professionals. And so there's a, I think the term gig economy doesn't really apply all that well to us. Yeah. Um, but that's the term that people know. And so when you hear gig economy, a lot of people think Uber driver, DoorDash. And there really is a big difference between the Uber drivers and professionals like writers, graphic designers, even doctors and lawyers. Many, many are also independent contractors. And Wilson Freeman, again, with the Pacific Legal Foundation, that's PacificLegal.org for more information there. Uh, th- this is going to impact um, quite a range, though, of, of workers in the country, right? Oh, huge. There are, there are tens of millions of people in the country who classify themselves as freelancers. Uh, and the Department of Labor, when they put this rule out, I mean, they knew that this huge group of freelancers, generally speaking, like my client, opposed the enactment of the rule because it, it imposes a lot of uh, additional obligations on them. It creates a situation where their companies uh, that they work with as customers are might be afraid to work with them because the Department of Labor can now threaten liability against their uh, against their clients. And uh, and if they do go as employees, I mean, that could entail a whole host of new obligations. I mean, freelancers like like uh, Debbie said, they want to be independent. You know, they, they own their, they're running their own business. It's just the assets and the employees they have are just one, generally speaking. That's why they're independent contractors. But that's still an independent business, and they should be treated as independent businesses. They should be given the respect uh, that, that they deserve. Now, the problem is the Department of Labor imagines or wants to pretend that all of these people need to be protected. They need to be uh, shielded by the Department of Labor's sort of benevolent uh, set of regulations and, and given the, the protection of minimum wage and overtime and all the other wonderful obligations big, that come with being an employee. Big but brother stuff right the there. Big, I'm sorry, but that's, that's com- big brother attitude right there, isn't it? Well, yeah, I think that's, yeah. Exactly, I think that's exactly part of what's going on here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other part of what's going on, I, I think, in terms of why this has come about is, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of union uh, advocacy behind these sorts of rules. I mean, this is, this uh, department of labor regulation, it's a very important one because it affects every employee and every prospective employee in the country, but it's just one front here. I mean, my clients got started advocating against uh, AB five equivalent. Now you may, I don't know if you know about AB five, it's a California law, which basically made it impossible if you're in California to classify yourself as an independent contractor. And a bunch of other states who have their own state wage laws uh, wanted to copy that. And these, all of these different, uh, you know, different state laws, they're all fronts in the same war to make it harder to be an independent contractor, make it harder to be a freelancer. Uh, and why that's happening, I mean, I think there's a lot of reasons. But, yeah, Big Brother is, is one piece of that story yeah. for sure. Um, 
is there a need to clarify some of these terms? Well, so in, without going too far in the weeds, in 2021, in the very last days of the previous presidential administration, the Department of Labor put out a rule which is very clear and very specific about who's an independent contractor and who's an employee. It created a, what we would call in the law a kind of safe harbor where if you do certain things as a part of your independent contracting business, you maintain control over the way that you do work, and you have an opportunity to make profit in the day-to-day operations, then you're probably going to be classified as an independent contractor. And independent contractors like my client, they love that rule because it's clear. It tells them, here's exactly what I need to do if I want to be classified as independent under the law. And if I don't do these things, I might be an employee, and that's not what I want. So I'll just structure my business in this particular way. That rule came out, like I said, the very last days in January of 2021 in the Trump administration. Now, the Department of Labor doesn't like that rule. (laughs) The very first thing they did when they got into office was try to get rid of it. Now, that attempt to get rid of it was already struck down once by a court. And that's because the way they tried to get rid of it was just not consistent with the procedures that they're supposed to follow for getting rid of a rule. So, you know, we're here, actually, we're here on this sort of second go round because the first time the Department of Labor tried to get rid of that 2020 rule, 2021 rule, they did so illegally. So now they're, they followed more sort of formal procedures But now they've created, instead of just getting rid of that rule, they've created a whole new rule, which, as I mentioned at the very beginning, it's much more complex. It doesn't give anybody any guidance, and uh, it's just a huge deviation from the way they were doing things before. So I think, think, yeah, there was no need for this. Mm -hmm. It had already been settled and resolved uh, at the tail end of the Trump administration, and uh, it's just the sort of rule – that the Department of Labor, uh, they don't like it. They're trying to get rid of it. It wasn't even a mud puddle then. It was fairly clear, and now it's a mud bog. Uh, it, well, that's exactly right. I mean, the idea, you know, the idea that the Trump administration had on this issue was to uh, sort of create a clear rule. Like, it, this law about who's an employee and who's a freelancer, I mean, it, it's been around for a long time, but And after AB5 and other sort of state efforts, the Trump administration, I think, wanted to create a very clear standard for under federal law, here's who's going to be an employee and here's who's going to be an independent contractor. It's a very very good goal and something that uh, my clients and others in their situation really appreciated. Uh, But the Department of Labor, I think they prefer a much more vague and ambiguous (laughs) standard because it gives them more power to enforce against employers that they don't particularly uh, like oh, and to, to so-called wield the, the big brother sort of uh, vengeance against uh, misbehaving uh, companies. Well, and, that, and those concerns are real, too. Uh, PLF attorney, that specific legal foundation, attorney Wilson Freeman. Also, Debbie Kaplan is with us, and she's the co-founder of Fight for Freelancers. Debbie, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to get more into what you do here, and i got a break up coming, but uh, have you ever bumped into prior to this uh, as in your um, career, so to speak. Have you ever bumped into confusion before that caused trouble, whether you were to be a contractor or an employee? I mean, it, was this an issue on your plate before? Um, it has come up before in that I've had California clients uh. when uh, AB5, which is what Wilson had previously mentioned about the California legislation, when that went through, it created a lot of confusion in California, and California clients had to start doing some heavy-duty paperwork and reevaluating how they worked with independent contractors, which really added a lot of time and effort to the process of trying to work with a client and make sure I could get cleared as showing that I was an independent contractor. So that's come up, um, as well as, as Wilson had mentioned, there's been legislation around different parts of the country. Uh, The reason I got involved in this is because copycat legislation was introduced in New Jersey, Mm. and we saw what was happening in California, and we jumped into action because we now realize what kind of harm this could have. And so we had to do a deep dive into that type of legislation and the types of rules that are created to determine who's an independent contractor and who's an employee. And you start hearing from people when, when you're looking at working with a company, uh, that that new rules like like these 
really do cause companies to get nervous because they don't want to get audited, they don't want to have fines, and they become they take they often take a more conservative approach in who they work with, which can mean that independent contractors like me get less work and the companies don't necessarily end up hiring people as W-2 employees, which is the whole goal of this type of legislation. Yeah, uh, one of the stated goals anyway. Debbie Kaplan is with us again, a journalist and a content marketing writer. Done some really good work. I checked your site out. Uh, you're not just uh, uh, you know out there with as a clickbait uh, writer. It's really good, uh, substantial stuff. Got a break up coming, then we'll come back with more and, and uh, get into this issue again. Uh, PLF attorney Wilson Freeman and Debbie Kaplan with more upcoming from Montana for Montana, Voices of Montana. No matter how far you may go, there's always one just down the road. Down the There's a new drink at your local town pump. New Belgium Voodoo Hard Charge Tea just might become your new fave. Grab a 12-pack and try it out for only $17.99. Plus, members save an additional $2. Town Pump, convenient and right down the road. Town pump. Right down the road. Pump it up. Oh, yeah. Hello, this is Bill Coffey, CEO of Stockman Bank. When you bank with Stockman, your money stays in Montana to work for you and your community. You will be working with your fellow Montanans who understand our unique way of life. From our executive leadership to our frontline employees, our team is almost 900 strong. We know firsthand what it's like to live and work in our great state because it's our home too. We are Montanans serving Montanans. Stockman Bank member FDIC. Ask any traveler. There's no other place in the world like the O'Hare Motor Inn. If your journeys take you to Charlie Russell country, stay where we do, right in downtown Great Falls. The modern western hospitality of one of Montana's most famous motels. Great food at Clark and Louie's Pub and Grill and the legendary Sip and Dip Lounge. The O'Hare's unique Sip and Dip Tiki Lounge features a glass wall between the bar and the swimming pool so you can watch the mermaids swim while you sip your beverage. You've got to see it to believe it. The one-of-a-kind O'Hare Motor Inn in Great Falls. Every year, thousands of 4-H youth enroll in animal and crop science projects. They learn their subject while learning responsibility through the lens of safety. A culture of safety teaches youth risk assessment and responsible decision-making, setting the foundation for a lifetime commitment to safety in all aspects of life. Montana State Fund congratulates all Montana 4-H member spotlight nominees and thanks youth volunteers for helping grow a safer Montana. For safety assessments and other agriculture safety resources, visit safemt.com. The Montana Supreme Court filed a decision Wednesday striking four laws down that would have changed the way Montanans vote. They would have added new voter identification restrictions, ended Election Day voter registration, limited paid third-party ballot collection, and prevented 17-year-olds from voting even if their 18th birthday fell on or before Election Day. The federal government has approved Montana's plan to address differences in broadband access. The decision opens the state up to compete for more federal funding to bridge the digital divide as part of the $2.75 billion Digital Equity Act. The Board of Public Education has given the green light for 18 public charter schools to open later this year, but the Office of Public Instruction says its reading of the law requires the schools to also be approved by county commissioners before they open. It's unclear whether they will meet the law's July 1st deadline to open. With Montana News headlines on the Northern News Network, I'm Brian Bennett. Studies show medical internists spend as little as 13 minutes with patients, including with those over 65. It's time for a health care measured in thoroughness rather than speed. And greater good health is here with a new model of senior health care. From comprehensive primary and preventative care to understanding chronic illnesses, Greater Good Health connects to your needs at your pace. Serving seniors in Billings, Great Falls, Missoula, and greatergoodhealth.com. Senior Health for the Greater Good. It's Ford Truck Month. Are you ready? And we're celebrating 47 years as the best-selling trucks in America with special once-a-year offers on Ford F-Series. Are you ready? Featuring the new 2024 Ford F-150 and Ford Super Duty, the 2024 North American Truck of the Year. Celebrate with us, America. This is Ford Truck Month. Based on 1977 to 2023 industry reported total sales. New Department of Labor policy is being challenged. It's trying to 
redefine what independent contractors are and essentially, if they can, as much as they can, make them employees. And that's going to affect a lot of people. We talk about that in Montana here, particularly a lot of truckers, small businesses. Uh, one stat that comes from the Pacific Legal Foundation, they're uh, the nonprofit, the public interest law firm that is um, pursuing this lawsuit uh, on behalf of, of Debbie Kaplan. And Wilson Freeman is with us, the PLF attorney, and, and Debbie here as well. But just to throw this out there, about uh, 10 to 29% of U.S. workers engage in independent work, up to 39% use it as a supplementary source of income. It does have a tremendous impact, I think, um, on, on, on how we are going to you know, be able to work uh, moving forward. So, uh, Debbie, thank you for being here as well, and, and Wilson Freeman with the, the PLF Pacific Legal Foundation. So, Debbie, um, you, you've got this group called Fight for Freelancers, and, uh, and also congratulations, an exceptional service award in 2021 uh, for, from the American Society of Journalists and Authors. Uh, talk about why you think we need a lawsuit here. Sure. Uh, so, like I mentioned previously, we have been fighting this on various fronts, both state and federal fronts. Try, but there's been a big effort in the last four or five years, uh, which we call freelance busting or anti-freelancer legislation, uh, where the government in various forms is trying to turn us into employers, which very much goes against you know, our, our federal freedoms and what this country was founded on. So we ended up fighting, uh, founding Fight for Freelancers, which is a, an organization. It's not really even an organization. It's, uh, we're a grassroots, self-funded, nonpartisan group of volunteers, and we, we started all this because we wanted to ensure our rights to continue as, as freelancers. So the old, uh, where we are right now is after, after going after state legislation and fighting the PRO Act, which is a different federal effort, um, this Department of Labor rule came down, and we were involved from the start, giving comments and writing comments as well as going to listening forums, trying to get our, our words out there that this is not something that freelancers actually wanted. And so when the rule was looking like it was going to be be finalized, uh, we were able to take action through a lawsuit, and I'll let Wilson talk about what's involved with that. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, before we go into that, um, sure. th- does this policy, potential new policy here, um, w- is it going to cost you, uh, you know, money? Is it going to just complicate your business? Um, what, what do you think it will, how will it impact Deborah Abrams Kaplan? Yeah, you know, there is always that concern that a policy like this that, it, that goes against freelancers is going to impact, impact business. We're already seeing, I'm seeing in my freelancer networks, I'm seeing comments coming in from other people's clients saying that they are looking into changing their models because of this Department of Labor rule. Mm-hmm. So it's already having an impact. Companies are looking at, at how they do things, and, and it's, as, as Wilson said, it's going to have a chilling effect on all freelancer businesses, whether we see it this minute or we see it next year. Um, it's coming, and I, I can't imagine that any freelancer who has multiple clients isn't going to feel it in some way at some point. Yeah, Wilson Freeman again, uh, the Pacific Legal Foundation, PLF attorney. Uh, let's get into that a little bit. Um, yep. We always see unintended consequences. Um, I think we're beginning to realize more and more uh, that, that we need to dig into these potential unintended consequences because oftentimes they're not going to be addressed um, in policies from the bureaucracy. Oh, for sure. I mean, the impacts here, I think, are, are going to be severe, but they're going to be creeping. They're going to be slow. The yeah. Department of Labor's rule uh, has just come, just come into effect, basically. And what the rule does is it changes the standard for who's going to be an independent contractor and who's an employee under federal law. That rule mostly directly impacts, most directly impacts companies that work with independent contractors. So what's going to happen to freelancers like my client is going to be a a gradual chilling. They're going to see their clients less interested in working with them because it's going to cost them more. It's going to cost them more in terms of compliance costs. It's going to cost companies who want to work with freelancers more in terms of just legal risk because the Department of Labor, what their rule basically does is it gives them a much more powerful tool, a much more – you know, a much bigger hammer they can use to go after 
businesses working with independent contractors and uh, and it really to bring the threat of legal action right into play without you know giving the Department of Labor sort of clear guidelines or, or giving individuals who operate as businesses clear rules that they can they can fit into to give themselves assurance that they're in compliance with the law. So really we're going to see a chilling effect. We're going to see a lot of costs pushed down on freelancers. So I've seen a lot of freelancers have had to say, you know, I've heard from their clients, well, now you have to document all your hours. You have to tell me exactly how it is you're doing your business. You need to tell me X, Y, and Z. All this has to be unpaid because I need to know exactly whether or not you're an employee or an independent contractor in the view of the Department of Labor. Well, you know, it's, it's really important to understand that this rule is incredibly vague because you may think, well, this is easy. You know, whether you're an independent contractor or not, I get a 1099. You know, I call myself an independent contractor. I'm an independent contractor. That's not the standard. The Department of Labor's rule is much more vague than you could ever imagine. It's, it's six factors. It's a balancing test. It's very hard to know whether you're an independent contractor or not without knowing the sort of ins and outs, the day-to-day of how you do your work. So, you know, it, it, really, it, it really has created a lot of potential problems for freelancers and, uh, and a lot of legal risks for companies that work with freelancers. Debbie, have you um, – you said that you had bought this in New Jersey, in New Jersey um, at, the, uh, at the legislative level. Um, also, I think uh, noted that Congress is trying to push back on this. Give us a, an update of, of where our lawmakers are on understanding this issue. So the law, some lawmakers understand what's happening, some do not. The, one, the ones who do understand are pushing for a Congressional Review Act to nullify or overturn the Department of Labor's rule. So Congressman, I'm sorry, Senator Bill Cassidy and Representative Kevin Kiley have introduced a Congressional Review Act, and they're looking for co-sponsors. Um, it's already, the bill, the House bill has already gone through committee, and it is eligible for a House vote. So a lot of legislators that we have talked to and people in our group have talked to don't really understand how this impacts freelancers. And what we've found when talking to legislators through the past five years is they're overwhelmed with all kinds of issues. The idea of trying to protect workers, of course, it sounds great. But they don't always realize that when you say protect workers, some, it, it, the flip side is you also could be harming some workers that you're actually trying to protect. So it's one reason we were excited to come on today to really let people know what this rule is about and so that they can contact their legislators to get them hopefully to co-sponsor this Congressional Review Act in both the House and the Senate I'll ask. as one potential way to hopefully overturn this rule. Yeah, I'll ask them about it. Um, uh, I've only got just uh, like 25 seconds left here. Wilson, is, is there a date uh, for this lawsuit? Uh, well, so the lawsuit's been filed. Right now we're just negotiating with the government over a briefing schedule. Hopefully what's going to happen is we'll get a, uh, we'll get a quick turnaround on uh, an exchange of briefs and, and get a quick decision here. But it's just so hard to stay with litigation. There's also a few other cases out there. And so I'm hoping, I'm optimistic, some judge somewhere will strike this thing down. Because I really do think it's unconstitutional and unlawful. Thank you, Wilson Freeman, PLF Attorney, Pacific Legal Foundation, and Debbie Kaplan as well. We're going to pick up, we're going to open up a new can of worms here, too, with the PLF as we come on back with more. From Montana for Montana, Voices of Montana. Voices of Montana continues right after this. (laughs) 